permeate the conversation. So let me say what, what people in DC think about what's going on in the war. Um, there is generally very broad support for what's happening in Iraq and Syria in Washington, DC. Uh, and by what's happening, I mean uh, US airstrikes. We've had over 800 airstrikes dropping well over 1,000 uh, 1, bombs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, killing 6,000 militants, uh, many of them not militants. Uh, we have uh, in the neighborhood of 3,100 troops in Iraq. The president just authorized 1,000 troops to kind of go on the periphery of Syria between Turkey and Saudi Arabia for the training mission there. So north of 4,000 troops by the time they all get there. Um, and all of this is generally broadly supported in the halls of Congress and in the administration and the conventional thinking here in Washington. The one part I will say that is the weakest supported because it is relevant for activism is the arm and the training of the Syrian rebels. The, the notion that we're going to kind of do a little around the edges. Um, frankly, it's not as satisfying to people as bombing and blowing things up, so it lacks that kind of, yeah, we're going to do something. Um, and it, it's just not satisfying enough that people realize how completely dramatically insane it is. Um, and, and it has the least amount of support. Um, we do have some strong AIDS war champions. They're not going to be anyone that's unfamiliar to you if you've been working on these issues for the last uh, for the last several years, folks like Barbara Lee, um, Jim McGovern, Walter Jones on the right, um, some folks in the Senate. Um, one thing I want to say about them, they're out on a limb. Um, none of them is, are, is comfortable with what's going on in either Iraq and Syria, either what the U.S. is doing or what's happening there. Um, and they are frankly in a town that none of the leading policy voices have any interest in putting forward alternatives. So they're desperate for alternatives. We're all desperate for alternatives. We spend a lot of time trying to pigeon, you know, put those alternatives out there. Phyllis put some really great alternatives out there. They get drowned out by the dominant debate in Washington, which is, should we be bombing more? Should we have more troops? Um, and they end up, our champions end up fighting back in that debate, saying, no, we shouldn't have more troops. And we end up having debates about what we do have debates about in Washington right now, which is the constraints to have on the war, whether or not we have ground troops. Um, should the war be confined to Iraq and Syria, or do we need to start taking on these groups that call themselves ISIS, that are popping up everywhere from the Philippines to Tunisia to uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan? Um, and then in that whole debate, you have a huge group of folks who are very powerful, who were all over the TV this morning, no doubt, talking about more and more and more. This will be, for lack of a better term, your, your Iraq War champions. Your Lindsey Graham, John McCain's, um, fill, in the, fill in the blank. All those guys that you know and love from our you know, decade plus of talking about how wrong they are about everything, they're still on TV, they're still on the op-ed pages, they're still wrong. Um, so what's happening here in DC, if that's the landscape under which kind of work we're operating? Phyllis mentioned that the president once again reiterated his desire to um, have what's called an authorization for the use of military force, a war declaration. declaration. Um, the last time the president tried to do this was in 2013, um, after the chemical weapons attack in Syria. And I think it's important that we, that, we, that we recognize that this was one of the great victories of the peace movement, is this, this, is, how, this is how war declarations are defeated. There was never a vote because the president didn't have the numbers and they pulled it back. And thankfully, there was an alternative mechanism with the uh, chemical weapons deal that the US and Russia worked out. But when that happened on Labor Day weekend in 2013, the conventional wisdom was that was going to be like a, you know, one of those 424 to 5 votes in Congress in the House. Um, it was a done deal in Washington. And the people in this room and millions and millions of more people out, outside and a number of folks on the right, and I think that's important, a number of folks on the right who had very, some of them noble, some of them much less noble reasons for wanting to defeat that, um, came together and they stopped it. Um, so that, that does happen. It does happen sometimes. It's very hard, it's very unique, it's very difficult, but it does happen. Before that, we had an authorization for the use of military force, was the famous one for the Iraq War. The vote was in 2002, the war started in 2003. That was the one that uh, you know, John Kerry was famous for, before he was against. Uh, and, uh, and before that was the 2001 AUMF. The reason I kind of go back through this is because the 2001 AUMF passed 72 hours after 9-11 um, is essentially the underlying legal architecture that the administration points to for what they're doing in Iraq and Syria. Um, 
They didn't come to Congress for a new war authorization despite what many folks asked them to do last fall. Um, frankly, because there was an election and they had been burned in 2013, they were very uncomfortable with what would happen if they did it again right before an election. Um, they probably, honestly, would have easily passed one, um, but they, they didn't want to do it. And so they didn't, and they came up with this cockamamie argument that no lawyer in their, in their right mind will buy, which is that that 2001 war authorization somehow covered the current war. And so now we're in this kind of weird dance where um, we're trying, they're trying to say, well, we've got all the authority we need, but really we need more authority. There's, there's, there's some stories out there about the lawyers for the military, and I have to say there are some very good lawyers who work in the military and try to keep the military on the right side of not just U.S. law, but international law. And there's very, very bizarre stories about them trying to argue about whether this convoy is targetable versus not targetable in Iraq. Um, and, and they want to kind of resolve that, so they want to have a new war authorization. The president said it in the fall, he'd be open to it. He's now saying he definitely wants one. Um, and more importantly, he's saying that he's going to send in the next several weeks uh, language to Congress. Pretty much the way this has always happened in time of memoriam is that the administration, which again is the, the instrument of the military, the part that controls it, says, this is, says to Congress, this is what we would like to do. Congress says yes or no and, and weighs what kind of constraints to put on that. So not out of tradition, the president's going to send this to Congress. Congress has an interest and has said they want to weigh this and that they'd like to have a vote. The timeline of what we're talking about is sometime this spring. Um, realistically, from the legislative kind of world, if this doesn't happen by later this spring, members of Congress will use other legislative vehicles to make this happen. So the safe money is that this happens sometime in the February, March, April time frame. Uh, otherwise, Congress will force the administration's hand a little bit later on. But again, you have to come back to what's that debate we're having in Washington. It's not primarily about whether or not to authorize the war or not authorize the war. It will be the debate in Washington about do we allow ground troops? Do we not allow ground troops? Do we say that this war is only in Iraq and Syria? Do we say this war is everywhere? And one of the fundamental parts of that debate is will this war authorization be just about ISIS, just about Iraq and Syria? Or, as it seems the administration may do, it, is this a replacement to the 2001 authorization? Is this the term the administration uses, right-sizing the 2001 authorization, recognizing it's 14 years old, we're not really fighting uh, the Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, the kind of core thing that this was designed for. So let's have a war authorization about what we are doing, what we think we might want to do. Um, frankly, uh, that's not something we think would be great. There are ways that that could be better than what we have now. There are ways that it could be much, much, much worse than what we have now. Um, and, and it comes down to, from our perspective, a fundamental question that we as activists will need to ask the administration and ask this president that in his final two years, as he's writing his legacy, does he want to be known as the president who ended wars, or does he want to be known as the president who made wars permanent? And that's going to be the key out of what comes out of this debate from our perspective. Is this going to be a war authorization that says, you now have war forever, everywhere? Or is this going to be something that actually puts us on a trajectory to do what the president has said repeatedly he wants to do, take the country off of a permanent war footing, put us on a path to ending wars, recognizing it's sloppy and messy, recognizing as activists it won't be what we would want, but is it pushing us in the right direction or the wrong direction? Just a little bit of how the nuts and bolts of this is going to work because it will inform your advocacy. What will happen, I said, is the administration will send something up to Congress. This will then go through two committees in Congress, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. They can't agree on what to call each other, but the Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate Foreign Affairs in the House. The Senate is likely to be the one that moves first, Senator Corker from Tennessee. I think we have good in Tennessee folks. Senator Corker says he's very interested in this issue. He has been hoping to make war permanent for several years. He's got this idea about how to make war permanent where all the administration would have to do is once in a while come to Congress and say, here's the new folks we're at war with and just kind of give it as a piece of paper. Um, his committee, he will be the one that ultimately writes this legislation. Uh, there are some really good Democrats on that committee, folks like um, Jeff Merkley, Chris Murphy, uh, not Jeff Murphy, uh, Chris Murphy, some others. Rance Paul is on that committee who is very, very 
good views that are in alignment with our community on this perspective. There's some really bad folks on that committee, like Lindsey Graham and John McCain as well. So there'll be a big fight in that committee. It'll go through the committees, it'll eventually go to the House and Senate floor. What kind of fight this takes in terms of in terms of amendments and whatnot will remain to be seen. But again, we'll get a little bit more direction in the next couple weeks. And the other thing I want to mention, because I do think it's important, is that our friends, our friends on this issue, folks like Barb really and others will will be doing things as well. Now, their legislation um, won't be the thing that gets marked up and voted on on the, on the House floor or on the floor of Congress, but it'll be a very good organizing vehicle to get co-sponsors. It'll be good messaging documents to say, here's the kind of path forward we believe in to take this approach. It's not perfect. Legislation's never perfect. Um, if you want perfect, you should read Phil's his books, because that's you can write a book perfect. You can't write legislation perfectly. Um, but uh, Barbara Lee will have a, a bill that says, here's a bunch of things you can do in Iraq and Syria that's not going to war. And we would rather do this instead. So there'll be some legislative vehicles like that. The last thing I want to say is, um, as Phil said, we do have to change our politics. And, and it's, it's complicated and hard. Um, and we've done it before. It took a long time after 2003 to get us to a place where the country was with us on Iraq. It may take that long again. Hopefully, it will take less time. But I do want to point out just one thing from the polling um, that is going to be a challenge for where we are right now. Um, and it is, frankly, the uh, partisan divide in terms of how people feel about which party is better at national security, which party keeps us safe better. For time and memoriam, for the most part, Republicans have been better viewed on that question. There was a sea change starting in 2006 because of the Iraq War. And from 2006 to about 2011, <coughs> sometime shortly after uh, the world, <coughs> Democrats were viewed by an average general public as more likely better at keeping us safe. Since that time, it's pivoted right back. By about 30 points, 60 to 30, the American public thinks Republicans will do a better job of keeping people safe. So I just want to throw that out there, that that is a challenge. <clears throat> now, the opportunity side is there's a huge fight in the Republican Party about what that means. You have kind of the Rand Paul wing, for lack of a better term, versus the John McCain kind of neoconservative establishment wing. So the Republicans aren't exactly as clear as they once were. But there's a lot of challenge in the American public, and a lot of the public education, the hard work that you guys did, 03, 04, 05, that kind of talking to neighbors, doing education, we're going to have to do that. It's going to take a long time. We're going to have to remind people that there are no easy answers to these problems. It is deeply unsatisfying to know that there are hundreds of thousands of people dead and millions of people suffering, and that we can't simply snap our fingers and make it better. But we tried snapping our fingers and making it better in Iraq. We tried it in Afghanistan. And the end result was more people dead and more people suffering. So we have to learn those lessons. We have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we have to realize that this is going to be a long way. And if, if I could leave you guys with one thing from the ISIS conversation, it's to say there would be no ISIS if there hadn't been an Iraq war. Right? And the, poll, the reason for that is, is there was just a polling out that's really, really interesting. And what happens is people fundamentally believe exactly what John just said. It doesn't matter what we're doing. They believe you can defeat ISIS, but it's irrelevant because what replaces them will be just as bad or worse. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to get them back to that place where they got to eventually with the Iraq war, which is that this is foolhardy. They're, they're there already. It's there. They just need that nudge. And so I just wanted to stress that. Thanks again. Thanks.